Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. So I'm going to talk about improving computer science education with free and open source style projects. And my name is Roberto Sanchez, by the way. So a little bit about me. Um, I guess I put a lot about, about what I am. I, I, I am a software engineer, uh, and, and I, I also do consulting. I've been programming since I was a kid. Um, and I've been active in some capacity or another with uh, free and open source software since 2002. Um, I also teach uh, computer science in the computer science and engineering department at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. Um, and that's my link to my LinkedIn profile there if, um, if you want to go see all the, the gory details about all the things that I've done. Um, none of it's really that interesting though. Uh, but uh, so the thing is, I'm, I am not a, I don't consider myself anyways a professional educator. I consider myself a professional who also educates, um, but I never, uh, other than uh, through my time when I was in the military and I you know, had to train other people, but training is different from education. So I mean, I don't have any formal education education, uh, so to speak. So I don't know if the things that I'm doing are right. I don't know if they're uh, wrong, I guess by that, by, by that, uh, notion as well um, but I've just you know been trying to find what works and and I found a few things that I think have worked uh, reasonably well and I'm just going to kind of talk about how um, I feel I've been able to give my students um, a, uh, a a good experience with uh, these types of projects that make the classes more um, relevant more interesting <clears throat> so the specific course that I teach at Wright State is um, introduction to the Design of Information Technology Systems. And uh, this is the description from the Wright State uh, course catalog. Uh, just so you kind of have a, a framework for everything that I discuss in this presentation is designed around this class and the topics that I have to cover and all that kind of stuff. So if you are thinking of potentially trying to do something like this in a course that you're teaching or in which you're enrolled or something like that, um, obviously you can you know, make uh, appropriate adjustments. Some of the things that I have to do with my projects are very unnatural because I'm specifically trying to hit something that the university says this course needs to cover. Um, I, I, I feel like I'd probably rather just teach like a you know process of software engineering type class or something where I didn't have to cover like specific programming topics, but eh, you know, them's the breaks. All right, so I will get into all the reasons why I decided to start uh, teaching, but um, when I did, and I, and I found out that I was going to be teaching this course, um, I, I immediately started getting ideas about wanting to try and give the students, oh, I'm sorry, so one of the things that say, I, I do have a slide at the very end that says questions, question mark, uh, but please feel free to interrupt, stop me and ask questions as I go through the presentation. Um, so, you know, back to when I found out I was going to be teaching this course, I, I started thinking about what, what were the things that I felt that I really liked about some of my programming and software engineering classes as an undergraduate, what were some of the things that I didn't like? And then what were the things that, you know, when I became a real engineer and started working on real projects that I looked back and thought, boy, I wish I would learn that in school, right? So that's kind of the, the sort of mental model that I, that I was kind of, kind of going through. So with that in mind, I wanted to craft a project experience that covered the academics that are required in the course. You, you know, in the last slide you saw the description there. Introduced students to a free and open source style uh, of project um, because, you know, as any, you know, good, respectable, you know, Linux running, free software loving kind of a guy, I figure some, you know, my contribution to saving the world is, you know, bring more uh, you know, potential, um, you know, open source contributors uh, out into the community, um, you know, at least, uh, you know, doing what I can there. Um, and then I also wanted to give the students a taste of what it means to work on a large project. So uh, part of this came from the idea that for the most part, I mean, I don't think that there's really any respectable, you know, program that you can look at now that doesn't have the students at some point do some kind of team project. I mean, I think that's a pretty universal thing now. But for the most part, we're talking about teams of two to six individuals, right? And the reality is there are projects, there are, there are projects that are, that are like that, that are just, you know, naturally small projects. 
But the reality is lots of projects are very big. You know, Mozilla, LibreOffice, the Linux kernel. Um, and then, of course, commercial projects, depending on you know, where you work and the kind of stuff that, that you're working on. So I kind of felt like a larger project would be uh, a worthwhile uh, kind of, a, uh, of an experience. And then I wanted to teach more than just what was in the book. My class, the, the, the programming language we use is Java because that's what the university requires. But I, I tell my students that I honestly would not be offended or disappointed if they sat through my class all semester and didn't learn a single new thing about Java and only learn the project experience because anybody can go pick up an API reference or Google, right, and go figure out, you know, how do I make a window, you know, close when I, you know, click a button. I mean, that's something that is trivially easy to figure out. What you cannot learn from a book is that experience of what is it like to work in a project and have to deal with you know, managing issues and how do I merge somebody else's code. You can't learn that kind of stuff by Googling it or by reading it in a book. So I really wanted to put the focus on that. And uh, this, I I'm generally modeled this after um, a software engineering class that I took as an elective when I was an undergraduate that had something that I felt was a good start uh, to this and I just kind of felt like I would take it to the next level with the, uh, what I'm teaching my students and it is still of all of my experiences as an undergraduate student um, well uh, there, there was the semiconductors class that I took that I was certain I was going to fail that I, I didn't uh, and I still don't understand why but aside from that particular experience um, the project experience in my software engineering class is one that I can look back on and I still remember um, the new things that I learned that was uh, my introduction to version control it was CVS back then, um, which, I mean, I would argue is better than nothing. I understand some of you would argue not really, but it was. Um, and then, um, you know, something that I look back on and I'm able to, to say, hey, you know, I learned a lot of valuable things from that experience. And I would like, you know, wanted to create the same kind uh, of an experience for my students that 10, 15, 20 years down the road, they can look back and say, hey, I remember the project that I did in that class. All right, so I'm going to talk about, and I had, a, I, I'll be honest, I had a really hard time squeezing this down or I guess figuring out what to talk about because I could probably talk for six hours, eight hours about all the different things. So I kind of picked four main, main topics that I want to cover, and, and they're, they're there on the slide. And for each one of these, I'm going to talk about opportunities that are presented by these uh, these particular you know topics that I'm that I'm tackling and then challenges that are presented by them as well right because there's no such thing as a free lunch so um, you know it's it's a balancing act and it's trying to to get everything uh, to work all right so then this is kind of just so you see what the presentation format is going to look like you know it'll be like some topic or whatever and then I'll, just to save space I'll identify something that was challenging with a little C in brackets something that I felt like was an opportunity as, a, as with an O in brackets all right. So one of the, the primary focus areas that I wanted to hit here was introducing new techniques and technologies. Um, I am continually amazed, and so the, the course that I teach is a 3,000 level course, so I get mostly juniors and, and some seniors um, that are taking maybe like an elective or something. I am thoroughly and utterly amazed at the fact that there people can make it to the fourth year in a computer science or computer, I see Tom laughing already, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> can make it to the fourth year in a comp sci or com, you know, computer engineering program and never have uh, you know, like written uh, an, an issue or, or a bug report or never had to um, uh, you know, like do anything outside of what the IDE does for you automatically or never had to, I mean, it just, it, it, it just the, the list is, is endless. Um, what amazed me was that um, very, very few students had any kind of exposure at all to, to version control. And so what I found is about four or so per class. You know, I usually start off, oh, who's used version control? And usually it's maybe, maybe four, sometimes two, sometimes six, you know, whatever. But in about that number, have used any kind of source code management uh, tool at all. So that's a challenge, right? So one of the challenges with introducing new tools is, by the way, in addition to all the topics I have to cover that the university says by the catalog requirements are required for me to cover, I also want them to learn all these other new things. And if you've never used Git, um, especially if you've never used any kind of distributed version control, um, it can be very, very challenging. I, I started with CVS, went to Subversion. I actually gave a talk about this last year at Ohio Linux Fest about kind of what 
it took for me to make the mental shift from centralized to distributed version control. The good thing is, for the most part, if students haven't had any ex exposure to centralized version control, um, they don't know that it's a thing. Um, so they can actually learn uh, distributed version control the right way. Um, and and it, it's, it's less challenging, but it is still um, a, a complex tool and something they have to interact with. So some students just muddle their way through. They don't actually really learn uh, any kind of version control. They just kind of make it work. They make their commits, they make their push. Um, I mean, I've, but I would rather that they make these kinds of mistakes and have these learning experiences in a, in a class project than, hey, you know, now you're in the workplace and you're working on a, you know, on a project and, hey, we've got to keep our code buildable and shippable, you know, that, that kind of a thing. So I feel like, you know, this is, it, it's a good thing, but it is a challenge because it does, you know, take some of their mental energy uh, toward this. Um, the, the, the opportunity that I realized out of this was the vast majority of the students uh, eventually realized the value of source code management. I, I've had students that come up to me and were like, um, yeah, so like last semester I did a class, you know, I did, you know, whatever, data structures or, you know, whatever class. And we had a group project and we shared our code via Dropbox. And I will never, ever, ever do that again. And I'm like, uh, you know, and every time somebody, you know, it's like says Dropbox or by email, you know, I just, I cringe. But it's amazing. They, they very, very quickly learn that it is so much better to actually use a proper tool for that. Um, and I mean, I, and I've had him come to me and say, yeah, you know, if, if this had been any other class, we weren't using version control, we would have, you know, tried to pull an all nighter just to get everything, all the code merged together, try to figure out whose code was current. Right, because you got five, six people working on the same module. So, so this is a, a big thing, and I've probably more than any other single thing that I introduce the students to. I feel like this is probably the most valuable thing. Um, just, uh, just kind of the, the feeling that I get from you know the feedback and just my own knowledge of how valuable it is as a, as a programmer or developer to be conversant in version control. Um, project management um, and. You know, again, so going back to, you know, what does a student typically do, right? So they typically wait till, you know, you sign a project and they typically wait till, you know, the day before the project's due uh, and then they all get together and then like the whole team sits together and pulls an all-nighter in the lab or something like that to get it done. So part of my project structure, and I'll get a little bit more into that later, is there are no due dates. There are no, um, there's not even really specific requirements. I kind of give them a general project concept and each team, when I started doing this semester, which worked better than... Uh, less bad than other things that worked in last sem in previous semesters was each week each team is responsible for coming up for, with their weekly milestone and then presenting it to me and then I give the okay and then that's what they're supposed to try to accomplish for the week. Yes. It's curious though, as part of your uh, techniques, are you using uh, project management Scrum or Kanban? Okay, so the question was if I'm using project management uh, techniques like Scrum or Kanban. Um, no, um, and and it goes back to the I, I'm trying to limit the amount of new stuff that I introduce. So I sort of came up with a something that kind of looks like the JIRA workflow, like the kind of typical workflow you see with JIRA but implemented over GitHub because I was trying to not like, okay, you know, and we've got GitHub for our code and we got this for that and we got this for this other thing. I'm trying to keep it um, without, over. I, I, the students are already overwhelmed as it is. So yeah, I'm trying to minimize that. All right, um, so, you know, one of the challenges, of course, as any real programmer knows, you know, managing issues, managing documentation, uh, takes time away from actually slinging code. Um, I've actually had students, you know, talk to me, email me, whatever. It's like, I'm spending so much time managing issues in GitHub, and I'm like, well, welcome to being a programmer. You know, programmers don't program 100% of the time. That is actually a revelation to most of my students. I, I'm, I'm not kidding. I mean, I know for some of us that are, you know, professional engineers and developers, it's like, well, duh, that's just how it is. For students, it is a revelation to find out that programmers don't actually program all the time. Um, so, but this helps them understand that the non-programming tasks are important, sometimes equally so, sometimes even more important, right? Um, when you've got 30 people plus working on a project, it is not feasible. I, when you've got four, this is why I want to do something with a you know, big, big project, um, because things that work on a scale of four or six people don't work on a scale of 30. It just doesn't happen. So they are forced to adopt some of these things and, and begin to understand their value, where if it was a team of four, they could just say, ah, we can just get by without that. We can just trade emails. We can just all sit around the same table, that kind of thing. So I'm trying to create an environment where the value, the relative value of some of these other things, you know, what I would consider quote unquote real or professional software development tools and methodologies really makes sense. So uh, the other opportunity uh, 
uh, out of getting them to see the value and actually begin to use these, you know, again, most of them have never used an issue tracker of any kind. I really would have thought, Wikipedia's been around since 2001. I really would have thought that like everybody would know all about wikis. My, this past semester that, that just finished this past week, I think I had like three students that actually had ed ever edited a wiki. Uh, which I, that actually I found to be really surprising. I had more students that had experience with Git than with editing wikis, which I actually found, again, to be very surprising. But you know, once they learn these tools and begin to use them, they start to collaborate uh, much better uh, on uh, you know, when they can see you know, what, what other people are working on, what are the issues, what things are we keeping track of, uh, that kind of stuff. And it's not all just up here. And, I, and I, what I reiterate to my students over and over again, I, I require them to do every week Individually, the students have to submit to me a participation write-up that explains what they did for the project over the, the prior week. And then the teams have to submit a collective team write-up of what the team did for the week. And I always stress to them, you know, I want links to whatever GitHub issues you're working on. I want links to the commits that you made. By the way, I'm not inside your head. You know, pretend, pretend I'm your boss. Pretend you're sending me your weekly status report. You know, your, your pay for the week, you know, your grade, is going to be determined by, you know, my ability to confirm that you actually worked this week. Um, and I can't be inside, you know, I can't be between your ears. Uh, so you need to actually lay everything out for me. And, and I feel like this kind of a thing makes it easy because it gives them, they're already having to do it. And so it's just provide a link. It's not like there's, you know, these write-ups tend to be pretty short because, they don't need to explain a lot of stuff in great detail, unless for whatever reason, you know, I, I, every once in a while, you know, we're all, uh, hopefully we're all developers or, or at least understand the, the, how it works. You know, every once in a while you're like, yeah, you know, so I thought I was going to implement, you know, feature X, Y, Z, and it turned out it was way harder than I thought it would be. Um, and so I actually don't have a commit. I don't have any code to show for it. But here's all the things that I did. I tried this. I tried that. I tried the other thing. And that's kind of what I tell them. If you don't have commits, if you don't have stuff to back up to show that you actually did work for the week, I, I want an explanation of what actually it was that you did. Uh, I went off and I, I spent three days researching how to implement blah, 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 this, that, and the other. That's fine. I just want to know, you know, kind of what it is that they're doing. Um, and so, you know, the, that project management aspect there, they're needing to... Uh, uh, make that a, a priority in the project by the way that I've structured it. Um, so continuous integration. Um, this is one that I'm, I'm personally a big fan of. Um, I think more projects um, should use it. Uh, it it's one of the, the things where, um, especially when you have a lot of people contributing to a project, if you have one or two developers, it's really not that big of a deal. It's better to use it, but you can get by without it. When you've got 30 people all pushing into the code, it's really nice to know when something broke. I mean, that's, that's just reality. Um, and, and so the challenge here that I found, though, is that for the most part, students will, and this just absolutely and utterly baffles me, they will, at least at the beginning of the semester, will write code and will actually push and commit code without even bothering to see if it works. And that was kind of a revelation for me the first couple times that it happened. Um, and, you know, and, and, and I said, well, but didn't you look at Jenkins? You broke the bill. You know, it's like that's, we, can't, we can't have that. Um, so I've had to try a couple of different things. Right now, like for this last semester, um, I run a Jenkins server for the class. And so for this last semester, each team decided to make their own, um, their own branch within Git to be like their primary area of work. And then kind of when the features were stable, they would merge back into master. Um, and but then they were like, well, but we want to have like kind of like a place to where you do work in progress. So each team also made a development branch that didn't have to be that I wouldn't get on their case if the Jenkins build broke on that one because then they could make you know make their code changes. Like I can't get this to work. I'm just going to push it so somebody else on the team can look at it. Um, and that so that that seemed to be a good balance right there. The opportunity uh, that I found here is that you know this provides me a, a, a teaching tool to be able to show them, hey, having a working build is a feature. Right? I mean, we talk about, well, you know, software needs to do this, software needs to do that. You know, shipping working code is actually a feature, and that's one of the things I'm trying to get them to understand, kind of the larger context. Uh, static analysis, uh, because this is Java, uh, I use check style and find bugs. Um, I find that the students really get frustrated by cryptic errors. If anybody has ever used any of these tools, they can be very pedantic, um, and, and it can be very frustrating. I am a, I've been programming for a while, and I occasionally get quite frustrated by them. But I'll tell you what. I feel like for every one time that I'm ready to just like go, you know, hunt down the, you know, creator of check style and like, you know, try to, you know, bash his brains in, 
for every one time that that happens, there's probably like 20 times where CheckStyle was like, oh, you forgot to check if this thing was null before you dereferenced it. Or, oh, you forgot to, you know, do this other thing. Or, oh, you know, you passed a concatenated string into your, you know, uh, call to the database or something like that, um, you know, where it's really helped out. And so the students find that a lot of the stuff that they thought was okay is not. I mean, these are, you know, there are legitimate reasons why you don't want to do some of these things. And this is a great tool that helps them begin to, to learn that. Uh, but again, there's an upfront productivity loss. So, you know, especially at the beginning, the students spend a lot of time just trying to make check style and find bucks happy. But I think that's okay uh, because I see that, you know, kind of once they get over that, the productivity goes up and, and the code quality is better. They begin to learn what buggy code looks like so then they don't make the same mistakes again. And then later on, and I've had students tell me this, like, gosh, if we hadn't had check style with all of its really annoying, you know, like, oh, your curly brace is, on, is not on the same line as your method declaration. So I don't want to get into a philosophical argument. I, you know, I, by executive fiat, created a style and said, this is just what we're going to do, right? And the reason for it is consistency, not because one method is better than the other, but the idea is that later when we go to do these big merges, when the modules, you know, especially because at the beginning, you're just kind of a lot of code churn, creating a lot of, a lot of, a lot of software, and then you got to do some big merges kind of in the beginning. Um, you know, I've had students come back and say like, yeah, you know, if the code hadn't all kind of looked the same, this would have been impossible. So they, they learned the value of, you know, consistency and things like that. <clears throat> um, so collaboration. Again, like, like I mentioned, the, the idea of working in teams is, is nothing novel here. But working among, you know, teams of teams, teams collaborating with other teams, I feel like that's um, not nearly as, uh, as common. And um, as, as happens in any time you have a team, there's an unequal distribution of effort, right? Who's ever been on a, on a team, in a real team in the workplace, where everybody contributed equally? Yeah. <laughs> I thought so. So they get to learn a life lesson out of this, right? Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunity here is that the students, by having to collaborate within teams of teams, they are able to, um, they're able to learn, you know, what that inner team coordination is. You know, each team has a, has a team leader, and, and what does it mean if, hey, you know, this team's working on something, this other, you know, we're working on this other thing, and we need the thing that they're working on, you know, inter project dependencies, you know, all this kind of stuff. They, they're starting to learn uh, that kind of thing. They're not just working in isolation. So there's a good you know, experience that comes out of that where sometimes they're just like, you know, we couldn't finish because you know, this other team we're waiting on there, you know, uh, this last semester we did a, uh, a database browser. And it was kind of like, well, you know, we were waiting on their, you know, uh, module that would take all of the, you know, table output and parse it and show it a nice, you know, JTable widget and all this kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, you can submit a query through our part, but it just, you know, vomits all over the console because we don't have something that will take the output and do something with it. So, you know, they, they get, begin to learn, you know, kind of what inner project, you know, dependencies are and all that kind of stuff. Um, communication. Uh, is another big one. There's a tendency for the students to want to meet in person. I think we just kind of have a natural sort of human tendency to um, uh, to want to actually, you know, meet, you know, in, in a physical space together and work, you know, collaboratively on something. Um, and because, uh, you know, everybody's busy, and, and, I'll, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but a variety of other things. Um, I use Slack. That was actually a suggestion for one of my students. I did not use in the first semester. Um, at Wright State, they use a system called Pilot, which is truly awful. Um, if you ever had the misfortune of using Blackboard or any other learning management system, it is equally bad or worse. Um, and so I made the mistake of saying, well, we'll just use the, the forums within, Pi uh, Pilot's actually a, a branded version of Desire to Learn. So if you, if you know what Desire to Learn is, it's, it's pretty awful. And uh, so anyhow, uh, that sucked pretty bad. So then somebody was like, yeah, you should use Slack next time. So I, I've tried that and it actually worked really well. They, they begin to learn about asynchronous, distributed, remote um, collaboration, interaction, you know, tie this together with being able to use Git and, you know, Johnny can work on some code, commit it, send a Slack message to, uh, to the team channel and say, hey, I couldn't get this working. Could somebody maybe pick this up later and try to get it across the finish line or whatever? So they begin to learn, you know, what some of these, you know, collaborative interactions are like where everybody's not, you know, physically sitting around the same table in the same room. All right, so academic requirements. So that's the list of topics that I'm required to cover. Swing, uh, networking, RMI, which was 
not terribly evil 20 years ago, but there's like about a million better options for it now, but it's in the course description. I've actually talked to the department, I'm gonna try to get the course description updated so that way I can change some of these things out in the fall. Uh, but then we've got XML, Java Beans, and then JDBC for databases. All right, so go back to, you know, near the beginning where I was talking about sort of the concept for I wanted, you know, a project that does this and a project that, you know, that creates this kind of experience and all that. On top of all that, I have to find a project that covers these topics. Um, I usually can live without uh, covering uh, remote objects, um, and, and this last semester we kind of went without networking because it was a database browser and the JDBC framework kind of handles all the network interactions you need for that. But I try to cover four or five at least of the topics if I can. It is amazingly difficult to come up with ideas for projects that cover all, all of those things in a way that um, and I'll get to this later, that scales at this at the appropriate scale that I need. Um, and then at least you know the, the opportunity here out of this is that the students get to work on multifaceted code. They get to work, now granted the teams tend to you know sort of focus in on a specific area, but it's all there in the project and they help each other out and things like that. And so they get to work on code that does a lot of different things. So it's not like just some small um, you know kind of thing. The previous um, professor that had taught the class uh, that, I, that I'm teaching now um, kind of went with a more traditional, you know, lecture for two weeks on, you know, on, uh, for example, JDBC. Okay, now, um, you know, the assignment, you know, each student individually writes, you know, like an address book application. And I took one look at that, you know, they gave me all of his materials. And I took one look at that and I thought, oh my goodness, if I have to grade 36 address book applications and 36 tic-tac-toe applications and 36 echo client implementations, I'm going to murder somebody. <laughs> so, um, you know, that part, that was also a strong motivator for me to come up with a good solid project concept that would let me cover as much as I could under the umbrella of the one project. Now, I still have to do homework, quizzes, exams, um, and, and it is challenging to tie together the assignments with the project. Um, and I'm still working on that. I have not, I don't feel like I've done a good enough job of that yet, and so I'm still working on how to tie those things together. Um, grading is by far the worst part of teaching, at least at the university level. I mean, I'm not dealing with like little kids, you know, running around and like, you know, off their, you know, ADD meds or, or you know, things like that. Um, but the grading, oh my goodness, is awful um, because um, it's just not fun. I mean, I would much, much rather like focus on, hey, let's all, you know, like just have the project experience and whatever experience you draw from that, you walk away from and I'm, you know, hey, A for life experience, right? Um, I would much rather do that. The university will not let me get away with that. Um, and of course, because I don't have a lab component to my class, this is just a lecture class, um, I get no TA. And because I don't believe at, at this level in true false multiple choice questions, I use all short answer essay questions. Because what I really want to try to do is, is make sure that the students are actually understanding the material and experiencing the project. And I can't do, I feel like I can't do that through two true false multiple choice questions. So I do a lot of reading. Um, so usually my Sunday afternoons are devoted to grading. That's just kind of how it is. Not fun, but I do it. Um, and then the opportunity here though is that it's, it's not like study, study, study the material, cram for the exam. It's learn by doing, right? It's do the project. And if you do the project and you implement, uh, you know, a, a, a database, uh, you know, interface or something like that, you know, a JDBC browser or whatever, you're going to learn everything you really need to know from an academic perspective of what's important about that, and you'll have actually gained a useful experience out of it. Not just, you know, I read 30 pages out of the book and I crammed for it and I could answer all the questions on the exam. So I try to make my exam questions uh, focus on tying the topic with the project experience. So within the context of the project, which means I get to rewrite the exam every semester, yay. <laughs> but I feel like it's important because it is a way that I can, again, gauge that the students are really engaged and really understanding. So this part of it is, is very challenging and I don't like that part of it, but I feel like to give my students a good experience, I kinda gotta just knuckle under and, and, and just do it. Okay, so now the project concept itself. So. Lots of challenges here. I kind of talked about it a little bit with the academic requirements, um, but now, in addition to that, I have to be able to create a project that's accessible to varying skill levels. So this course that I teach, because it's a 3,000 level course, has prerequisites. Despite that, I have students coming in who can barely, and I mean barely, squeak out a hello world in Java. Um, and, and that's just makes it very, very challenging. Um, 
Now, I've had students approach me and say, you know, well, you know what, I, I, I you know, I'm being left behind by my team, or I've had others that come in and say, well, you know, I've got, um, you know, the stuff that I want to do, but nobody else on my team understands it, and you know, I've tried to explain to them, well, that's a pretty real world kind of a scenario. You know, when you come in as an intern or as a junior engineer on a project, you know, you're going to have people that are, you know, ten times better. At programming uh, as you and you're gonna have to make an effort to catch up with them or if you're the senior person you're gonna have to make the effort to bring you know the new guys up to speed um, so that, that there is a challenge there but then the other thing that I tell the students too is hey there are lots of non programming tasks we have documentation we got uh, you know issues have to be managed uh, they we use the milestone feature in github to try to create milestones um, and then of course there's just team members helping each other out so even if you're not an ace programmer if you just happen to be good with something you can sit down with someone who is a good programmer and and then you know, you know, collaboratively uh, come up with something. So again, it's, there's a challenge there, but um, I don't, I don't, I don't know that that takes. That's not. I don't think, I don't think it's a solvable problem. That's just a an occupational hazard. Um, the other piece is the project has to scale to a 15 week semester. So coupled with trying to cover these specific you know topics or or uh, yeah, Java topics, it makes it very challenging because it needs to be a project that can be broken down where the teams can create viable weekly milestones. Again, they get to experience, you know, the real life, um, you know, fog of war, so to speak, right, that comes with real programming, like, okay, we're doing, I don't really call them sprints, but I just call them weekly milestones, right? So, okay, for this week, we want to try and do this. And I, you know, this past semester, I had, you know, one team that said, we want to do this for, you know, our milestone. And I said, well, that sounds like a big task. Make sure you guys spend some time up front and break it down and make sure that you feel like you can accomplish the whole thing. They didn't really break it down quite as well as they should have. And they ended up taking four weeks to do what they thought they could do in one week because the task just ended up being very, you know, that much bigger. So I try to give them some guidance on here, but I still let them make their mistakes because I want them to get, you know, get the experience. Um, and, and so they, they do, they get that, that real, you know, projects experience, hiccups ex experience, so to speak. I mean, it's just... Uh, you know, a reality. Um, they also learn to work uh, within within constraints, right? You know, there's a schedule constraint. The semester will end after 15 weeks. Now, I try to structure the project so that we have a goal of a working application. And this semester, our application at the end of this semester did actually work, um, which is good. I didn't set a specific, at the beginning, set of features that needed to be in there. I just kind of created a project concept for them and said, okay, let's, you know, let's get some ideas, put some stuff on the GitHub wiki, and then the teams kind of started congealing around specific features they wanted to implement. And we actually have a working application, um, which is better than in previous semesters where we typically haven't had that. Um, but it's still, it's still a challenge to, you know, something that you can implement within, uh, within 15 weeks. And, and it's just, I, I feel like in every, every semester I get feedback from my students on a variety of different aspects of this. And, and I always feel like I'm telling them, well, yeah, I understand. And if this were the real world, here's what I would have would have done differently. But within the fact that we've got 15 weeks, within the fact that we've got literally beginner programmers all the way up to people who've been programming as a hobby for you know six, seven, eight years, to you know professionals, you know there are some. Uh, the class that I teach is also dual um, coded as a graduate level class. So I've had a couple of graduate students in there as well. But the idea is that uh, you know the, the the project concept. I try to make it as uh, realizing that I can't cover everything, I try to get the best fit that I can. And I just, unfortunately, some things just don't turn out as well as I would like. Okay, so I empower the students to make their own decisions and make their own design. So this past semester, for instance, I got up at, you know, in front of the class, first class, and, you know, after the typical, you know, first lecture intros and that kind of stuff, talked about syllabus. So, okay, here's our project concept. We're going to write a database browser. If you've never seen a database browser, and I gave links to a couple of open source ones that they could go look at, and that was all the guidance that I gave them at the beginning. I said, now, jump on the GitHub wiki, start throwing ideas up about features that you think we can implement, this, that, and the other, and we kind of started trying to develop a body of, you know, potential feature ideas and, you know, kind of a, a big, you know, communal pot that teams could pull out of for things to go implement. Um, this um, creates chaos. Um, the students are not at all I mean, the only ones that have any experience with idea with things like this are 
you know, ones who are like going back to school, they've already worked out an industry. If they've only ever been students, uh, and I get constant feedback on this, and well, you know, up until this class, all that ever happened was the professor would give us a thing and say, you know, you're going to write a calculator application, and you know, the inputs are going to look like this, and the outputs are going to look like this, and if any deviation from that, you get points marked off. And I don't give them any of that stuff. I just say, we're going to make this application. You know, let's figure out what it's going to do, and then let's go make it do that. Um, and again, so I'd probably I'd say the first two, maybe four weeks. For the first two weeks, practically everybody's lost. Um, after week two and into week three, I've noticed that a couple of the sort of very forward-leaning, you know, um, uh, very bold type A folks really start getting into, okay, I, th I think I can, you know, I, I can step out and start doing some things, and then people just kind of fall in behind that. Um, you know, they just aren't accustomed to directing the project themselves. They're accustomed to being, give, being given very, very detailed specs of what to do. And I do recognize that there are, you know, instances where that happens. If you're developing a guidance system for a missile, yes, you're going to get an extremely detailed spec from the government. It'll probably look like, you know, seven telephone books, you know, stacked up on top of each other. But the reality is that a lot of development nowadays, especially if you're in a startup or something like that, it's very agile. It's very, you know, developer driven. I mean, you're trying to serve the customer. And in this case, I act as the customer for them. But the idea is that the developer's like, hey, what about this? Hey, what about that? You know, there isn't a lot of, well, you know, the spec says we have to produce, a, you know, output that looks exactly like this or take input that looks exactly like that. So I kind of give them that, that, that freedom. They learn to drive the project themselves. It takes some time, but they do learn to drive the project. And I found that that um, is, is rewarding for, for quite a number of the students. Now, Another aspect about the project is that I still, in addition to the grading and all the other stuff that I have to do, I still have to mentor and evaluate them. So I try, and I failed, like probably, I made it to maybe week nine in the semester this time before I didn't have enough time anymore to review all the commits. But I try to review every single commit in GitHub. I try to review every single issue in GitHub as the comments are made and you know, try to provide some guidance, suggestions, um, things like that. Slack really helps here because Slack has uh, Jenkins integration and GitHub integration, so I can create a Slack channel for the Jenkins build uh, messages and then a channel for all the GitHub messages, and then it all just shows up as a big activity feed in there, everything that everybody's doing, um, and that makes it easy for me to go in there and see kind of where I left off and then go in there and I look at the individual commits and make comments and, and things like that. Um, they, they need, you know, the students need that guidance, you know, for the most part, the vast majority of them are very inexperienced programmers, so I feel like it is important that I don't just let them run amok, right, that I'm giving them guidance on, hey, you know, this is how, this is the idiomatic way to do this sort of thing in Java, this is what is right, this is what's, uh, you know, you can't do that for these reasons, or, well, you know, that's fine for a database with 10 rows, but what happens if the database has 10 million rows? You know, now what's going to happen, you know, trying to get them to understand and sort of think beyond the, the very immediate short term. And then, uh, I, I'm still trying to come up with a way, well, I get to practice being a program manager, not something that I particularly enjoy doing or not something that I ever wanted to do, but I have to because I kind of have to sort of manage the chaos, herd the cats. Again, I try to be hands off, but I still, you know, try to sort of generally keep things moving in the right direction. Uh, I feel a good opportunity here that the students can help with peer review. And I had a, a student at, at, at the end of this semester give me a suggestion that I think I'm going to try to implement uh, uh, next semester. I've been struggling with a way to get the students involved in looking at other people's commits and then commenting on them. You know, GitHub has a good way for doing that where you can just go in there and look at the commit and then just, you know, hit like a plus sign next to the line you want to comment on. You actually can make inline comments. You can make a comment down at the bottom on the whole commit. All this kind of stuff. I've been trying to encourage students to do that and I haven't really seen much success with that. But I've got a couple things I, I think I'm going to try next semester, maybe incentivizing them with extra credit points or uh, something like that to help the students get more involved. You know, one of the things that I try to tell the students is, you know, programming is not a write-only activity, right? I mean, you know, you have to read other people's code. And in fact, um, in, in my consulting work and in, 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 all, in all the work that I've done, I have probably read 10 times as much code as I've written. Um, and I'm trying to get them to understand. That's another thing that programmers do a lot of is read other people's code and take time to understand it. So uh, it's something that I can do here um, and, and increase the, the, the participation from a peer review perspective. I think I'm going to uh, try some things with that next semester and, and see how that goes. But I feel like that's a kind of maybe help take some of the load off of me having to, you know, literally look at every single line of code, which can be a lot. Our, our project 
uh, this semester ended up, at least of what stuff got merged into master, in excess of 3,000 lines of code. Um, that's a pretty decent sized project for 15 weeks, plus all the code on all the other branches, and I review every commit on every branch. So, I mean, it's a pretty, uh, pretty tall order. <clears throat> so that, in and of itself, is a, it can be a challenge. And then I try to broaden the student's horizon. I kind of talked about the more, you know, learn by doing, not by studying, that kind of thing. Um, who's familiar with Joel Spolsky, Joel on software? I, I, I love just about everything he writes. Um, so I use readings from his blog archive as homework assignments. So things that are not specifically, they're not Java specific, but I try to relate them to things that we are using, you know, that we're doing in the project. So for example, he's got a great article that he wrote on, you know, distributed version control is here to stay. So I have him read that one. He does a great, he has a great article that he wrote some years ago now on daily builds. Um, we use Jenkins, so I, you know, have them read that one. Um, you know, a variety of other, of other things like that. The challenge here is, I mean, it, there are so many good choices out there for additional, uh, you know, kind of reading material you can use to help broaden their horizons. Just even figuring out what's out there has been a challenge. And so I'm trying to, you know, incorporate some additional diversity. And th at the beginning, when I first got the class, I didn't have that much time until the very first semester that I was teaching had started. So I um, just kind of said, well, I'll just use Joel on software because I'm familiar with some of his stuff and I have specific things in mind. Uh, but I'm trying to add in some more uh, diversity, maybe from other authors, uh, things like that. This helps the student gain uh, a, a fair bit of outside perspective. Um, I, I try to think or I try to get the students to think uh, about more than just, you know, coding up a weekly assignment, right? So that's part of the reason why the project spans the start to the end of the semester. It's not like turning the project, move on to the next one. It's whatever you worked on last week is going to still be there and you have to continue to build upon it. So I want them to, you know, get that aspect of it. Um, but, you know, the challenge is that everybody's busy. Everybody has work, family, other classes. Um, and so it is just, uh, it's very, very challenging. So this semester I asked the students, you know, rough, you know, guesstimate of about how much work they thought they were able to put into the project on average across the semester on a weekly basis. And generally people said about two hours a week on the, on the project. So if you think about it, you know, working on anything just two hours a week, that's not a lot. So it's, I'm trying to get, you know, the, make the project uh, as accessible as possible while still doing all of these other things that I'm trying to get it to do. So, so it, it is challenging, but it does, um, you know, it does give that opportunity for them to learn some, some very interesting things. Um, students can make a better decision about whether programming is really for them. I put that, you know, in quotes as, you know, whether it's software development, computer engineering, software engineering, software development, whatever, computer science, as a career. I have had students that come into my class, because at the beginning, you know, we do the typical intros, you know, what's your name, what's your major, what year are you, what do you want to be when you grow up, all that kind of stuff. And... You know, I've had students who are like, well, you know, I'm, you know, Johnny and I'm a computer science major and uh, I'm a senior and uh, I decided I don't really like computer science anymore, but I'm almost done. So I'm going to finish my degree and then I'm going to go, you know, work as a botanist or, I, you know, something like that. Uh, and then, you know, to the, the absolute reverse, you know, I, you know, hi, I'm Billy. I'm, you know, I spent three years as a history major and then I decided I really like programming. So I want to switch to, you know, be a computer scientist. Um, I've had n numerous students come up to me and say, you know, when this class started, I thought that I hated programming and I thought that I never wanted to program another line of code after I got out of college and I wanted to go to something completely different, but I love it. You know, once they get the, you know, a more realistic experience. Then I've had other students who are like, I totally thought I wanted to be a programmer and I realize I hate this and I'm going to go, you know, study law or something, you know, different like that. So I feel like it gives them an experience by which they can better determine whether this really is, uh, you know, a, a career for them because I... I I came, well, I was coming out of school near the time of the, uh, well, sorry, I was, going in, I was going to college, going into school, near the time of the dot-com bubble. So there were lots and lots of people who were like, oh, I can get, bless you, uh, I can get, you know, $90,000 a year with a comp sci degree, sign me up, you know, had no other interest in, you know, programming or anything like that, no love for it or anything like that. And, and that was a very, you know, common thing. And those people hated it. And, and we all know people who hate their work and it shows, right? So if I can help the students come up with something, you know, an experience that helps them better understand, is this really what I want to do with my life? Because even if you change majors as a junior or as a senior in college, that's better than getting all the way to graduation and getting a job and saying, wow, this really sucks. And I really don't want to do this. 
So I feel like that's something that I can that I can do for them. All right. So some some parting thoughts here. Um, I, I found that teaching in this particular fashion, the way that I have chosen, is it is challenging. Uh, I, I put a lot on myself. Um, I teach I teach as an adjunct, which means I effectively pay the university for the privilege of you know consuming oxygen in one of their classrooms twice a week. Um, it's 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 almost not worth. The, the hassle, it's, it's not, almost not even worth the you know, paper my pay stubs are printed on. Um, they pay so little for adjuncts um, because I have to do so many different things. I have to be the instructor, the project manager, the mentor. I have to you know, be the customer and so on. It's very time consuming. And I, I recognize that I could very easily have coached and I very easily could have taken all the slides from the previous professor and all the dinky little assignments and just said, here, do this and treated it like busy work and not done any, any real work. But that's just not who I am. And so, uh, and again, I felt like to me, the experience that I had as an undergraduate was so valuable and I felt like there was, I could build upon that and create a valuable experience for my students, so I felt like that was really what I wanted to do. Um, at, to reiterate, grading is not fun, capitalized, trademarked, um, it's just, it is, but you know, but it, it's, it's required. You know, I, to me, I would rather the grading be, you know, hey, at the end of the semester, let's look back at what we accomplished. Let's look at how many commits we made. Hey, let's look at how many issues we closed. And I would much rather grade based on that, but I am still in an academic setting and the university is accredited and they would get really upset if I caused them to lose their accreditation um, and probably not let me back in. So I do the, you know, standard, you know, grading stuff you'd expect in a school. Um, but while it is challenging, I find it equally or even more so rewarding. Um, I've had students come back and tell me it's an absolutely unique experience, never experienced anything like that in their educational career. Um, I've had students tell me how it's helped them improve as programmers. I've had students come and tell me, you know, I had a job interview for this internship and I talked to them about this project that we did and, uh, and they were like completely blown away. I mean like the, to, the idea that they could be interviewing a student for a summer internship that already had real uh, you know, something approximating what it's like to work on a real, you know, large scale project. Uh, you know, he said that it just absolutely blew the interviewer away. He got the internship because he had this experience and they felt like, hey, this guy can come in. And because when you, especially when you talk about summer internship, it's like, okay, you know, you show up and you're the gopher. You get coffee for everybody and you file all the stuff that, you know, people don't want to be bothered with. Or you can come in and you can really hit the ground running and do something and this guy said you know he was able to really hit the ground running and even though it was a short period of time was able to really kind of sink his uh, you know sink his teeth into it and, and get a lot of, of value out of it and provide a lot of value to the employer um, so that was good and again like I've talked about you know students have told me uh, time and again how uh, the experience has helped them decide whether they really love or they really hate programming or whatever and I find that it also makes me a better developer I find that you know working with especially the, the the younger you know younger programmers, less experienced programmers, guiding them, mentoring them, uh, just kind of helps make me a better a better programmer. I feel like I um, am able to find uh, you know look at things that they do and say yeah you know I, I probably would have done it like that and then and then realize you know because it's not my own code right when when you're reading your own code just like when you read your own writing or whatever you you look at it and you see what you want to see or what you think should be there. When you're looking at somebody else's, that's you know why it's such a good idea. Obviously, to get somebody else to review your stuff. You see it for what it really is, and I've and I've and I've recognized that. I've looked at something and said, you know what? I have done that exact same thing, and I realize that that's actually really ugly, or that's a really bad, you know, for whatever reason. Um, so I find that you know on a small level, it makes me a better, or on a low level, I would say, makes me a better developer. Uh, but even on a higher level, it makes me a better uh, manager when I have to manage development activities. Um, it helps me. Um, just, just in general, um, I feel kind of sharpen my skill set. So in that regard, um, I, I feel like I benefit uh, from this a fair bit as well. All right. So are there any questions? I had, I had one question during, so I'm everybody else just kind of. I don't know if maybe because it's like it's afternoon, you all kind of went to sleep on me like my students tend to do. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Do you have to deal with a lot of unlearning bad habits? Okay, so the question is, do I have to deal with unlearning a lot of bad habits? I, I have bad habits that I need to unlearn, but I presume you're asking about the students. Uh, um, to a certain extent, yes, um, because the in school, you know, the 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 time frame is so artificially compressed that it is do whatever you have to do to get your code building and to where you can turn it in. It doesn't matter how ugly it looks. And that's the general mindset. So I find kind of breaking them of that mindset is really challenging. I find check style and find bugs and making them break the Jenkins build helps because 
then I email the team or I hit them up in their Slack channel and I say, hey, your bill's broken again. Why don't you all spend some time fixing it? Um, and so I find that that helps. Uh, but I, I don't pretend that in a semester I'll, I'll you know, break them all of, all of all their bad habits. But but there are a few. You got another question over here? Yeah, how do you handle um, team dynamics though? Like kind of, you know, when they can't stand each other after a while? Okay, so the question is how do I handle team dynamics? Um, I would say I've been relatively fortunate. Um, I, let's see here. In, in the fall of last year, I had one team where the skill level disparity was so extreme that it was... I mean, let's put it this way. I had one student that was writing networking code that I couldn't understand. Uh, and I mean, I was, I, I, I don't know, I guess combination of impressed and fearful, I guess. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it was, I mean, it was wow. Uh, so that, I mean, that in and of itself is a challenge. You know, I talked to him and I said, look, you know, you're leaving your whole team behind. I'm like, you're leaving me behind. I'm like, that's kind of a problem because it's difficult for me to evaluate what you're doing. But, um, you know, so I, sometimes like in that instance, I talked to them, you know, for the folks that felt like they're being left behind. I said, hey, you know, talk to the, you know, the more advanced folks on your team, sit together, you know, do pair programming, you know, learn by doing that. This semester, I had a team that kind of fell apart because of the six that started off with the semester, by the end of the semester, only one was still regularly coming to class. Um, that was a problem. I kind of recommended that the ones that were still coming to class and active just sort of join another team. So I kind of, you know, sort of broke that team up and moved them into another team. But for the most part, the team dynamics seem to work themselves out um, reasonably well because the the teams also have to interact with the other teams. So I mean, they eventually, in, internally as a team, they kind of have to get their act together if they want to be able to functionally interact with other teams. So that kind of acts as a motivator. Any other questions? Yeah. Anything else, really? Yes? Uh, you see, like, with the, the notion of motivation, um, mm -hmm. how motivated are your students? Are they, like, like, the motivation level is kind of parallel to the skill level, or do you see discrepancies? Okay, so the, the question is, um, motivation level, do I see a correlation between skill level and motivation level? Um, so I think I can, I can say almost universally that the highly skilled students are almost always highly motivated. I've got a couple of exceptions. There's some outliers there. But for the most part, the ones, I've got some students, I've had some students that are very highly skilled and I think feel like the class is a waste of their time and therefore they don't bother with it. So in that regard, they're unmotivated, but again, those are outliers. For, for the less skilled um, students, it's kind of a mixed bag. Some of them really want to learn, and, and the idea of, of a project, that you know, something that's kind of real world, kind of gets them charged up, and, and I see them really get involved and really get engaged. And then I have other students that, you know, it's like they you know, may get engaged for a couple weeks at the beginning, and then they kind of check out, and then you never really, uh, never really hear from them again. So it, it, it varies. Um, I put my effort into the ones that are engaged because I, I can't, I mean, I'd love to save the world, but I can't. Are there strategies to try to get them more excited about it? Or more excited? I mean, I feel like I've tried to make the project as accessible as possible and try to make sure that the teams, you know, work to be inclusive. And for the most part, they do. But every once in a while, you get one that just, it's just not, not functional. Okay, um, did, yes, you had a question? Uh, how do you prepare your students for the dynamic? large corporations, how do you prepare them for the perpetual conflict between development and test, marketing and engineering? Um, I don't really take it to that scale um, because I just feel like that would be too much. Um, so, I mean, I talk about it a little bit, and some of the Spolsky readings that I have them do kind of address some of the, you know, what it's like to work in a real company. You know, if you've ever read any of his stuff, he talks a lot about what it was like when he was on the Excel team at Microsoft and, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, um, but I don't really address that really within the class or within the project just because I feel like it'd be too much. I mention this because uh, in my career, what I found is that your survivability in places like Microsoft, Intel, mm -hmm. HP, depends upon a certain extent of you being able to give up control because the entire process is so big and there's so much chaos yeah. that if you can't, if you insist on too much perfection or if you insist on too much performance from the people around you, you just don't last. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so the point is that, um, in, especially in large uh, corporate environments, there's kind of this, this need to sort of, you know, cede a certain amount of control um, or, or um, ego or, or whatever it is, right, just as, as a matter of your own survivability. And, and I think that's true to a certain extent. Um, I think the, uh, um, 
gosh, I'm struggling with like how to how to really formulate this. Um, you, whenever we have problems in the project, and we always do, and like it seems like every week, I try to use that as a as a teaching tool, and I talk about like, well, hey, you know, if you were working in a real company, you would have this big skill disparity. You would have you know things like that. And I, so I try to use those as teaching moments. Um, I personally am, I am I am perfectionist. Uh, I don't suffer from OCD. I enjoy it. Um, and let me tell you, the hardest thing for me has been to just, you know, let the students do the project. And sometimes the code is ugly and nasty. And sometimes the build breaks. And sometimes the issues don't get updated. And sometimes the milestones don't get written up. But but I've, I've had to learn to not lose sleep over it. And I sort of let that happen. And yeah, sometimes the team, one team says, yeah, we were waiting on that other team. And they said they'd be done this week. And they're not. And so we couldn't get our stuff done either. So I just kind of let those dynamics sort of naturally happen. And as they come up, I you know sort of use them as, as teaching moments, but I, I don't specifically try to um, you know hit on any of those specific things you mentioned. Yes. Do you uh, talk about mock objects so that you can kind of work around those inner inner team dependencies? Yeah, I mean we, we and that's basically what what they do is like well you know we implemented this thing or like you know like the one where it was like and one team was supposed to develop a widget that would take all the output from the database and format it nicely and show it in a GUI widget and all that and you know they said well you know we just did you know iterated over the result set and system out print line. And so it vomits all over the console. And so yeah, I mean they, they put a placeholder there, um, and and they do you know they they figure out ways, and really without me having to uh, give them a lot of prompting or details, they figure out ways to keep keep their stuff moving, which which I, I think is pretty good. Um, okay, so my slides are already up on the Fest uh, website uh, for the talk. Let me do one other thing here, which I realize now I may go back and update my slides. Oops. All right, so <clears throat> so one of the other things that I do is, again, because I use GitHub, and I actually gave a talk, uh, like I said, last year at Ohio Linux Fest about, um, or actually I guess two years ago now, about my use of Git within my class. And it's kind of funny because I've, you know, people came up to me afterwards like, well, aren't you worried that they're going to go and like look at each other's code or that they're going to go and look at last semester's code? And I'm like, well, I, I, I'd be thrilled if they did. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I'm trying to teach them collaboration. And I, and I always tell them, you know, I mean, I've had, and some of the, you know, more um, um, knowledgeable and skillful students are like, hey, can we bring in this open source library to do this? Can we do that? Um, yeah, absolutely. By, by all means, please do it. Because I'm also trying to get them to understand programmers don't invent all their own stuff, right? They use libraries, they use this, they use that, the other thing. So I try to get them to, to do stuff like that as well. Um, so that said, um, I, so I, I may go back and revise my, uh, oops, my slides to include the link to my uh, GitHub. It is not um, especially pretty. These are the three semesters that I've taught this course so far. Um, and uh, I mean, I can tell you, it's all the, all the stuff's out there if you want to you know, kind of see you know, what happens if you turn a group of 30 students loose. Um, I mean, like I can show you quickly here like our network diagram. So, I mean, you can see, you know, we've got some some pretty big contributors here. One thing I don't like, GitHub's metrics are not, like, ideal. So, like, um, this guy here, see those numbers? He was the merge monkey for his team, right? Mm -hmm. So, and his team did a lot, a lot of code reformatting at one point. So, you know, like, this, the statistics aren't ideal, but they give you a general feel for, you know, who does, who does what and who's, you know, who's contributing and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> That's a technical term. <laughs> Did you use the same uh, project for each of the? Nope, projects? I've done three different project ideas. Uh, okay, so uh, first uh, semester I did this. Uh, I thought, hey, it'd be cool if I did a game. So I had my kids help me come up with some gameplay rules, and I wrote up, you know, did some mock-ups and uh, and everything. And because it was my first time trying this, it was a complete and utter train wreck. Um, we got absolutely, I mean, not even close to a working project. I mean, it was, it was ugly. The second semester, 
Um, we did, uh, what did we do the second semester now? Um, let me look at my Jenkins here. Second semester was, oh yeah, so I went to a, <clears throat> I, I, I've, I've gone to Startup Weekend a couple of times. If, if nobody's ever been to Startup Weekend, it's actually really cool, you should try it out. Um, I went to Startup Weekend and the team that I was on had this really cool project idea and it didn't end up not going anywhere. So I asked the guy whose idea was if I could use it for, uh, for my class. So the idea was, you know, like I have some damage to my house, like, you know, a hole in the wall, you know, kid punches a hole in the wall, I need it fixed. You know, rather than like call three different contractors and like have to be home while they come and do estimates, I can take pictures, measurements, blah, 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 upload it to this app. And then they, uh, you know, can give me direct quotes over the, over the app without having to actually come be on site and me take days off work and stuff like that. Uh, it was originally for startup we conceived as a mobile app and I just kind of turned it into a standard, you know, Java swing app concept. Uh, that one worked, uh, that, uh, that was less of a train wreck. Uh, this semester was the database browser that uh, the, the class decided to call SQL Lizard. Um, and uh, I, have, I had one student who was really good with Photoshop and did some re really cool, uh, you know, like splash screen and stuff like that. Um, and that one actually we ended up with a working, working database browser, so I was, I was pretty happy with that. Next semester, I think I'm going to try to do a file browser, you know, like the, you know, like Nautilus or, you know, the, the, uh, you know, like the typical, like, like that kind of, you know, show me the, the file system and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think I'm going to try to do that next semester because some of the students found it really hard because they just didn't have experience with databases. Conceptually, like an application that was completely centered around the concept of interacting with a database. So the file system browser idea that I'm going to use will incorporate the GUI, it'll um, incorporate, um, I've got a concept for networking and, and the remote objects by saying, hey, I can run a daemon on a remote machine and then I can connect to it and show the listing on the remote machine. Um, XML um, for uh, formatting the directory listings and then using the database to cache the information. So that's kind of my, I'm, I've still got some refinement to do, but uh, I came up with that concept about, about a week ago. And I think everybody understands inherently, anybody who uses a computer inherently understands a file browser and how it's supposed to work. So I hope that it'll be less chaotic at the beginning because they'll have a more solid concept of what the thing is supposed to do. Does that make sense? So that's that's kind of where I'm at. So hopefully fourth time's the charm. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Or Okay, I think we're out of time then. Yeah, I had time. All right. Yeah, I'm creepy. <laughs>